when children experience a high level of trauma, you have heightened degrees of cortisol. You're more on high alert. Your fight or flight response is higher. You have more anxiety. Lack of safety from my childhood was now feeling like the universe and the world itself was unsafe. When you are an adult, make sure you have kids only after you have solved your personal problems or an extent of your personal problems, especially if it creates violence. I think it primes me for spirituality. I think it primed me for a very independent life. The universe has its own way to connect to you. It tries to connect through people and that doesn't happen. It connects through music. It tries to connect to art because it's all the same. It's all calling for you to start believing. There is more to life. There is hope. I can get in contact with, with my subconscious, my soul, whatever word someone wants to call it. Inner self, higher self, whatever. It's as soon as I get a feeling that, okay, I'm being called to do something, I immediately pretty much do it. This is part of Dreamer series, where we delve deep into human psychology to make sense of people. Today's guest is Anton, a successful YouTuber and podcaster, who has a lot of interesting concepts about childhood trauma and how it affects adult life. Feel free to watch his story till the end. And as you do it, don't forget to subscribe. It means a lot to me. So maybe we should start from who you are. So who are you, Anton? Oh, big question, man. Um, yeah, I would say, who am I? Um, well, th there's there's two there's two things I want to go into this. Uh, first of all is, who do I think I am? Why do I think I'm here on the planet in this lifetime? And then secondly, what do I what do I emotionally kind of see myself as? Like, how, what's my relationship? My my confidence? Um, yeah, like, do I like me? Um, but the, for the first thing I'm going to answer is like, who am I and why am I here? Um, I, from a very young age, I would say I didn't fit into society. I didn't fit into the schooling system. I was expelled twice before grade two. I was suspended like 25 times growing up, man. And so, and, and the reason why I bring this up is there's just this all, there's always been a part of me that is, um, I wouldn't call it anti-authority, but it's it's a part of me that refuses to do what I don't find authentic. And so when you're growing up, you're going in kindergarten, the school system, um, so many like you're being told who you are um, and you're being told how to act, how to, you know, or essentially take part in society. And so at the core of who I am is somebody who just marches to the beat of his own drum. Um, I am very passionate. I am very, I don't know if I call myself opinionated, but I have strong perspectives that I, I believe to, I don't know if I believe them to be true, but I think some of them, uh, skirt around the truth. Um, and I, I feel like I'm here to be a, I want to describe it. I think I am here to be the embodiment of radical authenticity, honesty, and vulnerability. Um, and especially vulnerability. Um, and, and what I mean by that is like, I think like a lot of time when I hear about people talking about authenticity, I think of like confidence, courage, like, you know, be authentic. It's like almost a masculine thing I, I hear. When I hear, hear that at least, I'll think, oh, like be strong, be courageous, be masculine, be authentic. Um, and I think a huge part of authenticity is actually like, if you're a man being able to be soft, uh, being able to be vulnerable, being able to share like authentically exactly who you are in the moment, how you're feeling. And I think that's healing for all human beings. Um, because I think it gives us permission to be honest with ourselves and each other. Um, so that, that, so at the core level, I think I'm here to embody and express radical vulnerability and authenticity on a global scale uh, with my podcast and honestly with everything I do. Um, I think I'm also here to show a new way of behaving and interacting with each other on a global scale. Um, like one thing that my brain for whatever reason does is it thinks in terms of societal systems so like whenever I think of people, I'm always observing who are you, what's your role in the collective, um, who are you becoming, and, and how, because I, I think all human beings are neurons 
in the collective called humanity. And I think we all play a part. Some of us are like the throat chakra of humanity. I think I am. I think I'm, I've been give I, my number one expressive asset or my artistic asset, my number one would be my voice and my ability to articulate uh, things into fine detail. So I think that that is my role. Um, and I, and I'm confident and I'm grateful for that. And at the same time, I'm not good at everything. Um, other people are much better athletes than me. A lot of people are better at math than me. They just comprehend certain things in a way that my brain is like, not really interested in that. I'm more interested in psychology, philosophy, spirituality, and making models of reality. So again, to summarize your question, who do I think I am? I think I'm here to, um, build the, us new human story, a new model of what reality is almost like a quantum physics principle, and then merge that with what it means to be a human being, quantum physics, human vulnerability, trauma, mental health, and then speak about all of these things through my podcast. And also what I want to do is I want to get into making movies, uh, books. I want to fund up and coming musicians, uh, directors, and to, for this, I need to be making likely hundreds of millions of dollars um, in the future. My, my goal is to create an empire or at least provide the, the idea and the possible framework for a new kind of Hollywood empire because I think Hollywood has become so corrupt. And if I'm partnering with people like Mel Gibson or Mark Wahlberg or spiritual people, Tony Robbins, Eckhart Tolle, like... It doesn't matter who it is, but I just, I have this vision for a new future uh, for humanity. And I feel like I'm here to help be one of the spokes that spearheads that forward. Does that make sense? Does that land for you? Yes. Uh, so what I hear from you, you consider yourself to change the world in a certain way. And, and you see as an orator, you could kind of like spearhead that moment. Um, so I understand. Um, maybe we should start from one of your early memories, and then we build from a, a thread from there to how you got where you are right now. So would you like to choose a memory? Yeah, man. And, you, and you'll definitely see where my ambition comes from when you see my, my, my childhood, man. Uh, but yeah, so my first memory ever was, I think I was about three years old. Um, three or four, I remember I was living in King City, Ontario, Canada. And I remember I walked outside. Um, I was in the house. I walked outside and I just, I've always been an adventurer at heart. Like I just, I just, yeah, I get these ideas. I'm like, I want to go check that out. So I left my house and I just started walking to the park, um, which was just around, it was just around the block. Um, and I didn't tell my parents. I was like, I don't know. Can, can, how, how good is a child's communication at three years old? Do you know? It's going to be hard for the kid. <laughs> I hope. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give myself permission. So, uh, or at least I'll, I look at this fondly then. Um, I already did kind of, but so I went to the park and I was just like hanging out in the park. And then I hear my dad just screaming like my, my name. And I was just, I remember, um, a lot of um, fear in my body. And then so my father comes and he sees me and he, and he beelines it to me. Um, and then, and, I, and I'm not going to be graphic with this, um, but if anyone's been spanked or a a ever went through any physical trauma, maybe this is a um, trigger alert potentially. Um, but I remember my father enraged and he was likely experiencing fear. Um, and then that fear probably very quickly turned into anger. Um, and then he just started, um, yeah, he just started like hitting me on my backside. Um, and I just remember just um, complete terror, fear. It was like almost black and red. Like my, my memories of this are very, um, there's a darkness to it. Um, a lot of like rage energy. Um, or at least that's how I perceived it being three years old. And I remember he was just like, yeah, he was just like yelling, yelling at me and hitting me. And I remember from a very young age, I, and I don't know when this thought popped in my head because I don't know when language starts to really pop through the head of a child, but I know, uh, since then I have overlaid at least the thought of, um, I am not safe. 
uh, with this person. I'm not physically safe and I'm not emotionally safe. And so this, I think, was the first memory that really spearheaded my life into this life of like hyper independence, likely challenging authority, being expelled in the future, suspended, not trusting a lot of authority figures. And really, I think this is where you see this part of me that is idealistic to the degree that it is. I, um, I wouldn't consider myself completely an idealist, but that's definitely my dominant way of looking at the world. And I think that a lot of that was, I didn't feel safe growing up. And therefore I've always, you know, I always went into video games and books and movies. I always loved Harry Potter. I love these magical stories of friendship and love. And, and I think it was because I never felt that growing up. I never felt safe in my, in my family. Um, yeah. So that was my first, uh, my first memory. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, I, th I think like when kids have a lot of trauma, in the early part of their life, they definitely get influenced by that. And then the whole trajectory in life has changed forever. Um, but I have a question for you. Why do you think parents act without thought to their children? Uh, right? Like, for example, when you are a child, when you are a young man, you kind of are a bit more aware than a three-year-old. And then you become a parent, you have a child, and then you kind of understand this as a kid, right? So, um, but why do you think this adults who are supposed to act like an adult, a responsible, caring adult, become consumed by emotion and stop thinking logically? Why do you think that happens? Yeah. Um, the first part of it is uh, fear hijacks the ability to make um, conscious decisions um, and choices. Um, but you know, with my father, he was horrendously abused by his father. My grandmother was afraid to leave because she was afraid he would kill her, um, mm -hmm. find her and kill her. So you can, you can feel, you can see the, the rage, um, and the, the feeling of unsafety that my father grew up in the lack of safety. Mm -hmm. And so I think this stuff was like really in my dad's nervous system. And my dad actually is a very, he's a very creative, ambitious man himself. He's very, um, he actually is very loving. He's very uh, kind. Um, yeah, I would say he's kind. Um, I think he's, but he's just very broken. He, he never went to therapy. He never figured any of this out. And I think he had children before he had resolved any of his trauma. He still hasn't resolved really any any of his trauma. He's never done therapy, never done anything. Um that's that that's inaccurate he did the landmark forum um in mm -hmm. canada but i don't know if it, he took that as a he did he took that course which is kind of like tony robbins in canada he took that course more as like a business course mm -hmm. of how like social skills he he i think all the emotional stuff was too difficult and painful for him to touch at that time so i think it just kind of went in one ear out of the other mm -hmm. um but it, it helped him with business and so he had children. He had me when he was 30, uh, 36, uh, 30, 34. He had me at 34. And he had just not dealt with this trauma. He, he was still, he, he had this idea that he was going to have this family. And then we were all going to be this perfect Hallmark family. And then he would be, it's almost like he wanted to have this perfect family so that it would almost erase his pain. I, I think he almost wanted children that would be like, you know, hey, daddy, we love you. What do you need help with? He, you know, he saw me and my brother and my sister as like, we're going to follow him around the house. He literally, like, he told my mom this. He's like, you know, I want children to like follow me around the house. Be like, how can I help you, daddy? Like, you know, <laughs> you, you'll like fix a car. And they're just like, daddy, can I help? <laughs> like bring out food and wallet. Like, you know what I mean? He just had this, he, it, like in, in a way my dad is narcissistic but it's because his father made him believe that he was a piece of shit that he mm. didn't have any value and so he like if we ever forget his i don't know if we if we're late to saying happy birthday or we're late to he'll like just get pouty he'll become like a 14 year old kid and he'll just be like he'll be passive aggressive and send us messages or t tell my mom a message like it's just this has always been him growing up, right? And yeah. so I like, you know, to be very honest, 
you have children when you have children. I, I, I wish we lived in a world where people had the self-awareness to only have children when they dealt with their, their trauma. Like that, mm-hmm. like that's what I'm doing. I, I'm in a, co- I'm in a therapy program right now. I'm in a coaching program myself. I do coaching. I'm also going through, um, an NLP and IFS program with my mentor and, and I'm adding more tools to my toolkit. And I'm, I already had had known so much about my childhood. I had known already, but he's been helping me develop more modalities to actually like go into, he calls it the portal, where when you're triggered, you go into the portal and you find the earliest memory of where your trigger is stemming from. So a lot of my triggers come from feeling like my brother was the better brother, the more loved child in the family. So I'd go back and love that version of myself. But anyway, so back to your question, to summarize my whole point is he had just not dealt with his trauma. And so he has this relationship with my mother where my mother also hadn't dealt with her trauma. So she was p- people pleasing, but mm. she was, he just dominated the relationship, told her how to dress, how to act, what to wear. Um, he would yell at her in public if she put on lipstick in public. Like, he'd be like, women don't do that. So he has a lot of old-fashioned values, which old-fashioned traditional values, I don't think there's any problem with. But when they become a barrier to true human connection and treating each other with respect, then that's a problem. As if he hadn't challenged his own belief patterns, he hadn't... He hadn't challenged why do i believe what i believe where does my trauma come from my my rage my anger and so in a lot of ways um like in this first memory he was just fear he was afraid where's my son is something bad gonna happen to him but instead of grounding that feeling that fear and alchemizing with himself and getting calm and then communicating to me like because even if i don't know what he's saying you can like children pick up the frequency of how you communicate with them Mm -hmm. the the tone of your voice your body language the whether or not you have a frown and so you know like one thing i think he could have done which you know hindsight's 2020 would be to just ground himself and explain that to a three-year-old now again the logic isn't going to come through to a three-year-old, but it's like communicate. I, I think it's important to just communicate openly um, how you feel um, in all aspects of life. But yeah, so he just hadn't dealt with his trauma and that he just goes into volatile rage, which was a pattern of his, our entire childhood. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, I, you know, he was afraid and then enraged. And so what I'm understanding from listening to you is more of like a few things, very important things. Uh, Most important, I would say, is uh, when you are an adult, make sure you have kids only after you have solved your personal problems or an extent of your personal problems, especially if it creates violence. Um, And I I feel like, uh, you know, like even when you explained about your grandfather, uh, for him, it's a lot of frustration, right? Like not being able to fulfill his dream. He might have put a lot of time and energy to be an architect. And this has been his motivation all his life. But then he has to be okay with being a farmer. And that creates a lot of frustration on a regular basis. Like what am I leaving for? My dream, the, the, the path that I would like to go suddenly disappeared. And then it needs to go somewhere. So it goes to the family and then it becomes a depth in the family that they need to take to the next generation. So you would inherit a portion of that. Your brother will inherit a portion of that. So it's a, I feel like one man's action ripples through generations. Uh, so you yeah. need to be very conscious about having children and about like how it influences not just your family, but families that could happen in the future. Um, what happened? So let's say move a bit more forward. Um, how was your, uh, and, and I would like to also go into NLP, Neuro Linguistic Program. I think it's a very exciting uh, path as well. Um, so how was your um, teenage life as a person who's carrying trauma? 
uh, from an early age. How did you behave in the school setting? How did you behave with your friends? Yeah. Um, so growing up, like elementary school, um, I had I had one like best friend, Lucas, um, and again, it's 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 back to this thing like um, I've I've always craved deep relationships in my life. Um, ever since I was young, I've always craved deep relationships. And a lot of uh, people naturally can't provide that. Um, and I think the the craving of depth is a mixture of uh, coming from trauma um, that mm-hmm. will force you to go inside of yourself and, and experience a pain that children, I don't know if I'd say they shouldn't have to experience, but when children experience that a high level of trauma it it just it makes it gives you um a um what's the term for it you have heightened degrees of cortisol you're more on high alert your fight or flight response is higher you have more anxiety you're more on the lookout for potential threats uh you're more aware of other people's behavior and so it is um yeah and so it makes it made me at least crave deeper relationships. Um, and so I was friends with this guy, Lucas, my closest friend from grade one to grade eight. And then I had a lot of periphery friends, but Lucas was like my main relationship. Um, and then, and I was expelled, I was suspended a lot uh, before grade five. That's kind of why I stopped being suspended. But I was suspended about 25 times. Um, and then when I went into high school, I, so high school was interesting because that is where I accrued a very deep, uh, next level of trauma. Uh, because what happened was I was in science class. I was sitting beside this kid. I think his name was Josh. And the, uh, the, at my high school, the most popular kid in the school was also a bully. (laughs) So it was like, so it happened. It was a potent the combination. So I was sitting beside Josh. Uh, what's his name? Um, Jake was the bully and the very popular kid. He comes in. He tells me to get out of my seat because he wants to sit in that seat. I said no. And then he essentially, uh, for lack of a better term, he turned me into a, a pariah for two years. Mm. Um, and during, during this time, I lost all of my friends. Um, I, Lucas, uh, me and Lucas had a falling out. Um, I couldn't really talk or date any girls for two years, um, at this point. Um, because yeah, I was like social pariah 101, uh, number one in the school. And so that was, that also set me on a path in my life of, I think, um, I think it primed me for spirituality. I think it Mm. primed me for a very independent life. I think it primed me for a lot of independence, uh, because I just couldn't rely on anybody. You know, I couldn't rely on my father for protection. Um, couldn't rely on my mother for protection because she, she was afraid of my dad. So she wasn't protective. She'd just kind of watch and be like a wallflower, uh, Mm -hmm. to whatever my father chose to do. If it was call one of his children, a, a bitch and that he pities the man she will marry, which was my sister. Uh, so it was pretty brutal stuff. And like my mom would just kind of like just wash like a deer in headlights. Um, and so I learned, yeah, growing up, okay, you're not safe at home. Um, friendship is fleeting. Um, be, be wary of who you learn to trust. Um, and then society is untrustworthy because if this Jake kid can just come in and flip your entire world upside down, literally tell people, don't talk to that guy. Like he's not one of us um it's like yeah you kind of like lose faith in every single thing outside of yourself so i developed really thick skin i developed really um a high degree of independence um and at the same time there's like a a core sensitivity and vulnerability to me like i've always loved music and art and movies and stories and video games and stuff i've always loved imagine the re- the imagination realm so i've always and i think that was really me being attracted to spirituality before i knew what spirituality was because spirituality metaphorically is the fantastical it is the mysterious it is the 
Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? You're going to different dimensions and astral projection, astral travel. And people say they see like different, you know, entities and stuff. Like it's fucking Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, dude. <laughs> it is like, so, you know, like that I was always. And so I just kind of like retreated into myself for three years. Um, and then when grade 11 came around, um, a lot of things started to cool down. I started to, re I recreated myself with the grade nines coming in because I was like, ha, huh, these people don't know how much of a loser I am. So I can like reinvent myself and recreate myself. And so, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And then, yeah, so high school was interesting because I got into spirituality when I was 14. Uh, my mom got me because she was friends with a lot of psychics and mediums and you know, a lot of people actually are real in their psychic ability. And so, you know, I just dove into that. I started becoming fascinated by spirituality when I was about 13, 14, because, yeah, and then, you know, uh, you... Didn't, didn't have anything else, you know? Yeah, and I think that's where you found hope. And hope yeah. is a very strong thing and everyone needs to have it at some level. I feel like when I listen to your teenage, it feels like, I feel like the things that makes people feel stable, like family, friends, and the way the community kind of nurtures you. Those things, when it's not there, you are on your own, right? Like, and, and it has a very uh, foundational effect on people. Like you start questioning early in life, like what is the point of all this? Uh, where all these systems that is created to make me feel safe makes me feel scared. And uh, it's unstable, unstable. So I need to find new ways to make sense of life. And the way you explained about art and music connecting to philo um, spirituality, the way I think about it is that all things are universe and all things has a way to come to you. Um, you know, it's, it's more of like when people kind of push you away uh, or like society kind of like makes you feel it's you're not one of us. Universe has its own way to connect to you. It, it tries to connect through people and that doesn't happen. It connects through music. It, it, it tries to connect to art because it's all the same. It's all calling for you to start believing there is more to life. So there is hope. Don't worry about it. Like, look at the bright side. <laughs> um, and so uh, what happened after? So I can feel like childhood and teenage was filled with um, in a way, hard uh, memories. Um, mm. And you are growing out of the, your teenage and what is happening? What is your point of view about the world? Uh, what do you think about adults? Where do you want to travel to next in life? Yeah, so so one thing before I jump into that is I want to talk about, like me, like you said, music, imagination, art. Yeah, I think why, because you said like the universe... You know, people always say the universe is unconditional love. It's at least it's unconditional acceptance. It accepts you as you are fundamentally. There's nothing wrong. The universe even accepts evil. It even allows that. That's how much it accepts everything, right? Mm -hmm. And like when I think about my favorite art, music, and in movies and books, for me, it's the authenticity. It's that always in life I was craving depth. I was craving emotion. I was craving authenticity just tell me the truth what do you think about this how do you feel about this how do you feel about me what do you think of me i'd rather let's communicate openly as human beings instead of all these facades and social politeness um and 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 as we we're talking about earlier like polite society it's that always was annoying and that's why when i would read harry potter i was like i want to live in this world where harry hermione and ron are authentic and honest with each other where they care about each other, they love each other, they would die for each other. There is like, there is an ideal in that. There was like Frodo and Sam, like the Fellowship of the Ring and Lord of the Rings. It's like these people believed in something bigger than themselves and they're willing to die for it. It's like, I, ever since I was a kid, I, I, I craved that. I was like, they're like, I just, all this fucking fake bullshit is annoying. It's like, we're all afraid to to be honest with each other. We're afraid to be, a, to be rejected. It's like, so I always demand, that's where the imagination was for me. Music. I love rock and metal music. I love everything. I love singer songwriter, 
Rock, Metal, uh, Fleetwood Mac, Ed Sheeran, Five Finger Death Punch, like you fucking name it, man. Like even some hip hop and stuff. But it's like, what I like about that is the fucking brutal honesty. It's like, I like that in music, people pour their heart out. You know, if it's a song about philosophy and spirituality, they go to the places that they won't go in a regular conversation because people will look, look, mostly look at you like a deer in headlights. And then people will say things in music that if they told you in real life, they're afraid you'd go, whoa, you're screwed up. Like, you know, the things we tell are like the things that we pour into our art are the things that we don't just callously share with, with people. And for me, always, I was like, I want, that's what I want in my relationships. I think what's potentially unique about me is that I didn't wait to do it with art. I was like, I'm going to do it with my relationships, with my voice, with my expression. So rather than being like, I can't tell you how much I care about you, or I can't tell you how I'm feeling, so I'm going to write a song about it, I'm just going to develop the courage over decades to just have the courage to just tell you how I feel. And because I'm hoping, as I said earlier, like that's my my stand in the world is I want to get to a place in our world where we all are honest with each other. Where if I tell somebody, hey, I'm in love with you or I love you or I want to be with you or I want to date you or like, or I want to be friends with you, let's just say that and then have the courage and the and the faith. If you If you don't agree, tell that to me. Just say, hey, you know, Thanks for the offer. I don't feel the same way. I want to live in a world where we all value each other enough to be honest with each other and and have the courage to face our fears and be honest with ourselves and other people and deal with that. So that I just wanted to, to talk about that, about the imagination before we move on. I would like to add something as well. Yeah. So, for example, like in Hindu way of thinking, there is different spheres of time. Um, and they consider this as the end of time, Kali Yuga. Um, yeah, so, yeah, what, what I, so I feel like, and the reason why they do it is because the, you know, like the lives have moved to a place where it's fear, and there is like uh, individualism has grown too much, and society is focused on, for example, like capitalism, right? And I feel like um, people can be authentically open only if they have systems around them that makes them feel safe, that if I open up, I would be considered still a person in the society. Uh, so if the systems are put in a, in a way that it is driven by fear, driven by like structures of power, it's very hard to open up. Um, there would always be individuals who kind of start understanding like, okay, I am trapped by my own thoughts created by systems around me, and I would like to break off those chains and go forward and find meaning. There are always people like that in all um, all through history. So what you're talking about is the journey of the hero, in a sense. If you create from a story's narrative, it's a journey of the hero where he realizes where he is in, and he understands the only way to true understanding is to break all these things around and go and find meaning. And it might be a journey that you need to take alone but it's still worth it. So you still do it. Uh, so that's, it reminded me of that. Um, but with most people, I would say, since they're born into this structure, right? And they don't know anything else. And for them to feel, especially when they grow a bit more older, they feel like if we break all the systems that created stability, even though it also ke uh, keeps them chained, um, what else is there? If we go out of this, can we come back? Will people still accept us? So let's uh, let's play with the rules. Let's uh, keep lying to each other and to the world, and just keep ourselves to just with inside. Yeah, um, it, 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 if if I may jump in there just for a second, it's like I think my role is to be the embodiment of that possibility. I'm not saying everyone has to do it. I'm not saying everyone will. But like what you literally just said, you said people are worried. If I do this, will I be able to go? But is there a safety in this? Is there a, you know, if I open myself up and I fall flat on my face or someone doesn't reciprocate that, you know, can I find safety in that? And I, I think that is what I'm speaking to mm. is, you know, if I can show 
that yeah you know when you the cost of opening up is you will get hurt you, mm. there will be people that don't, don't get you that reject you but i've been through that enough and i've come out the other side and what i'm willing to say is that the value of vulnerability and authenticity outweighs the challenges of how much it hurts when you're rejected now uh, now at the same time i do want to say um being rejected and having people misplace your trust can be traumatizing if you don't have a coach or a therapist or you don't have the internal a landscape to be able to process that trauma so i i, I am aware there is a responsibility to what i'm saying because if everyone willy-nilly goes out and just opens their heart to strangers or opens their heart too early in relationships to people that are going to manipulate you abuse you hurt you it's like they can literally cause damage and i get that um but yeah i'm just wanting to create a a template for one possibility of a way to live and what the repercussions of that are but back to you okay uh, so let's move on a little bit more forward. So you yeah. kind of all have all this thought, and I feel like you naturally from life you've been a bit rebellious because you see, see through these things and you would like to rebel and see what is outside this kind of naturally like system that is closing around you. Um, so what happened after teenage? What was your, what did you want to do at that point of time? And uh, wh- wh- where did you go? Yeah, so after grade 12, I, I stayed back for grade 12 because I almost fa- failed grade 11. So, I, I yeah, I had to st- stay back just to get my grades up. But um, I wanted to be a high school teacher um, mm-hmm. because I, I, I realized, for me, grade 9 was the most difficult year of my life, um, just losing everybody. And there was a couple teachers like. I don't know if I'd like, it'd be an exaggeration to say they, they saved my life. They didn't save my life. But for example, Mr. Clarence was a teacher where I literally went to hang out with him every single lunch. Cause I didn't have friends. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I literally would just like, you know, mm. yeah, you know, even when I didn't even have his course, I would literally just go in to see him because I felt safe with him. He was a very loving, kind hearted man. And I know how much he, yeah he him providing that safe space meant everything to me um you know in a way when nobody else could uh give that kind of like unconditional support and Mm. and and love um someone that i I felt would you know listen and, and get what i was talking about so i wanted to be that for for students in grade nine and ten i wanted to be a grade nine and ten high school teacher primarily grade nine because i know because I, I, I'm always on the lookout for those creative, sensitive children um, who have something to offer the world, but if but will likely be broken before they can offer it. Um, or at least they will likely, like, it's almost like this, like, force of nature where it's, like, sensitive, vulnerable people just attract, you know, broken people. It's just a, it's an interesting thing. It's like, you know, moths to flame, right? That's it's like when you, when you, when you shine, you would attr- like a lot of really good people. Um, why do you think so many women who are very vulnerable and sensitive attract narcissistic, um, passive aggressive, abusive boyfriends? Hmm. It's like it, that, that sensitivity, it attracts that person who's going to overtake that. Hmm. Um, and so I wanted to, in some sense, protect, um, those people that I felt needed it if they didn't have it at home or that maybe they just, I also felt like there was like a, like a mentorship I wanted to do. So I didn't actually want to be a teacher. I, I didn't want to teach a curriculum. I didn't like school, but I was like, but I need, I need to find a way to help those children that need it. So when I was leaving uh, high school, I went to university. I went to Lakehead university um, for teaching. And so I did like a, I did this, interdisciplinary de- degree which was like equal parts education psychology political science and geography um so it was this like amalgamated thing and i did um yeah yeah and I'll, I'll get to the rest of that later but so when i went into university i remember i was like all right 
I've never been cool. I've never been popular. Like I'm going to be popular. I remember telling myself, I'm like, you're going to be popular, man. And so, yeah, sure enough. Like I went into university and yeah, you know, everything, like I, I took the opportunity to reinvent myself. And what was interesting is that I wasn't fake at all. It wasn't like I'm going to sell myself, but it was more like, look, the past is behind me. You know, I, I just had a bad draw in grade nine. Literally, I said I stood up to the wrong person, not even the wrong person. I did the right thing, but I paid the price. And I know, I know to look out for those kinds of people now. And so when I started with university, I was like, okay, I'm going to find all the people I love. I'm going to find people I resonate with. And I'm just going to express myself fully and be myself, be confident. And I started working out, you know, going to the gym, got a lot bigger. And, you know, I met just some really great people. And, you know, we just, I had the best time of my life. University to this day is the best time of my life. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Like now... I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm the most, I love myself more than I ever have now, but I don't know if you can relate to this, but university, if you had a good university experience, it's freaking awesome, man. Like you're in a hotel with your friends, you're in residence and like, you'd literally just like, I'm bored right now. I'm just going to go and just knock on people's doors until I find someone to hang out with. It's like, (laughs) you know, and just everybody is figuring out who they are. Everybody is, open and receptive to really like I think people are exploring their identities and I think it's just a fun time and you know like for me I got into partying and stuff for my first two years got really into partying all the time and then third year I was like I'm not partying anymore and then I went like stopped drinking and stuff for years and but it was like university man it was just it was awesome it was for me it was incredible and I was doing that teaching degree and I had high hopes of being a teacher and um yeah i found myself i i i I figured out what my abilities were i had teachers and professors that would invite me to do public speaking gigs because they're like you know you're you know you have a way with words you have a way with people you're a leader like you know people listen to what you have to say and so like i would you know spoke at a psychology conference that my fourth year professor sonia was like, you know, I want you to speak at this conference uh, with Dr. Stuart Shanker, um, who's a well-known Canadian psychologist um, with a couple of universities and stuff. And so, yeah, so yeah, university was awesome, man. And it was, yeah, it, it was great, man. It was great. So what I'm hearing is more of like you feel um, accepted and you feel belonged and people actually start seeing your value as a person and you you were around this group of people who didn't judge just much because they were young and they were also figuring themselves out. Um, what happened after university? What was life after university? Yeah, so what happened was, um, so in my last year, I started getting this idea of like, okay, because at this point I was into Joe Rogan. So I was just getting into podcasts and he, he had just interviewed a guy, Dr. Jordan Peterson. I know he's very, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of people have different perspectives on him. But for me, I I liked his psychological outlook. And I love, fundamentally, what I liked about him was I loved that he was a professor, he was a psychologist, and he was a uh, kind of a po- like a public speaker podcast kind of person. So he was like, yeah, he was a professor, public speaker, podcaster, public figure, influential figure. And I'm like, I love that. So what happened was, I remember being in fourth, the la- my last year, my professor, Sonia, she asked me one day, she said, wait, why do you want to be a teacher? And I was like, I want to have like an impact on, you know, the, the adolescence and the youth. I, I, that's where I feel. She's like, why don't you be a counselor? I was like, and it was kind of the first time I was like, um, uh, I just want to be a teacher. I didn't really think about it. And then what happened was I was going into my fifth year, which was going to be my practicum, um, my teacher's college. It was my teaching year where I was going to be going in and, and doing the like literally in-person teaching, um, substitute teaching and stuff like that, um, learning about the trade. And I remember I was just in the shower and it was like, I had just this intuition where I was like, I'm not going to be a teacher. And literally, man, it was like that day I got out of my shower. 
I went to the university office and I dropped out of university. Literally. It was like, like mm. in one moment, I just, I was like, I just knew it to my core of my being. I'm like, I'm not being a teacher. Um, and so what happened was I dropped out and then I was like, okay, I'm going to do what Jordan does. I'm going to do public speaking. I'm going to, I'm going to switch my major. I'm going to get into, I was really into a man by the name of Dr. Bruce Lipton at the time. Um, incredible man. And I had this idea. I was going to go to New Zealand. I was going to, um, go to the university of Otago in New Zealand, I was going to find Dr. Bruce Lipton in person and I was going to convince him to take me as his mentee. Mm -hmm. I literally, I I was, I had balls to the wall confidence, man. And in a lot of ways I still do. I just, this is the way my brain works. I'm like, I get this ambition. I'm like, I'm going to make this happen. And Mm -hmm. so what happened was uh, reality caught up to me and I started realizing, oh, it might be harder uh, to do this. Like I, I almost felt like I was going to like defy the laws of physics. I was like, I'm not going to do it their way. I'm just going to convince this guy to mentor me. And that will be my degree. I'll like, I'll get a master's degree in, in like, what would I, I think I would do like a master's degree in like metaphysics, like quantum physics or something. I was really into quantum physics at that point. Like, yeah, human nature, quantum physics, that kind of thing. And so what I figured out it was going to be more difficult than I thought. I got into a like a a, a near suicidal depression. Um, that was really really fucking dark. Um, I was having a lot of troubles with insecurity, with inadequacy. Um, a lot of my insecurities with my brother were coming up. My father, you know, feeling like I wasn't loved and respected by my dad. I never felt like my dad liked me, even even to this day. Like I'm like mm-hmm. I'm like I love my dad, like but straight up i don't think he likes me like it's like we'll we'll hang out go to like dinner and like i'll start talking about something he'll just like change the topic like he'll just like i'm just like huh okay and then he'll just talk about his boat for 45 minutes and then i'm just like yeah 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 it's, it's a bizarre thing so that was that was coming up when i was in my uh that time when i dropped out of college like just a lot of the trauma of like, oh shit, you know, mm. you know, your, your dad being really hard on you. Um, definitely like a lot of abuse, uh, physical, verbal, emotional, uh, passive aggressive manipulation, um, shit talk behind my back, telling me my mom says shit about me. That was not true. Like he'd just literally be like, yeah, your mom thinks you're lazy. Your mom thinks you're arrogant, a narcissist. And then I talked to my mom, she'd be like, I never said that. So like he was just it was bizarre stuff. He's he's very manipulative, literally. I, I accept him as he is, but he's very manipulative. Um, and so a lot of that that inadequacy was coming up because that feeling of lack of safety in my nervous system, feeling like I can't, you know, because I what was coming up was that feeling of of lack of safety from my childhood was now feeling like the universe and the world itself was unsafe. It was like, oh, you had these dreams. Well, no one owes you anything, you know, like no one gives a shit. Um, so I went down this like very dark uh, path where I just kind of like mm. almost gave up. I was like, okay, I, I, I don't think my life's going to work out the way it, it, that I thought it was. Um, and then I just was like, oh shit, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have dropped out of teacher's college. Like I, I made a huge mistake. And then I remember um, at uh, Christmas dinner, I was with a family friend, Irena, and she's a she's an incredible woman, just so loving and, and kind. She's actually a teacher herself. And everyone had left the room, and it was me and her at the dinner table. And she like asked me how I'm doing, and I just start crying. <laughs> like I, I was just like, I you know to, to be honest, I, I feel completely lost, aimless. I don't know what I'm doing all of these ideas I had, like, yeah, I, I, I just, I can't see any of this happening anymore. Um, and I think I've made a huge mistake and she just, yeah, she just like looked at me, she smiled and she's like, you know, I think you'd be an excellent therapist, an excellent mm-hmm. counselor. And, and then we talked about it for a while and like, and then I remembered Sonia telling me the same thing in my fourth year of university, my professor, um her telling me the same thing i think you'd be a great therapist counselor and then 
Anton's ambitions were, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a public speaker, counselor. Like I'm going to be a podcaster. And I remember going to the gym every day and people be like, Hey man, like, who are you? I'm like, Anton, I'm Anton. And I'm going to be a public speaker. Did like, I had this, like this thing, I just roll off and just tell everybody. Uh, but I, I was reignited. And so what happened was I decided to take half a year, like several months and travel New Zealand, which I was there for three months uh, in British Columbia, Canada. I just, I went, I, I caught the travel bug and I'm like, I'm just going to explore the world because I wanted to move to New Zealand. I was like, I'm going to find, I'm going to find a wife. I'm going to find somebody, going to marry her and then have children um, and then be a university professor, public speaker and all this stuff. And so I had the dream and I was going to go to, to New Zealand and just travel the world. And then, and then I also had recreated my idea of do meeting Dr. Bruce Lipton and convincing him to take me under his, his wing. I was like, and when I'm in New Zealand, I'm going to convince cool. Dr. Bruce Lipton to take me under his wing, uh, the, the wild ambition. And so, yeah, so I ended up going to New Zealand and having the time of my life. It was incredible. I like, uh, yeah, I was a changed person when I came back. I just, yeah, I, you, life was amazing when I like, yeah, life was amazing. And just, I, that's what I figured out. I was, a, I was an adventurer. I am an adventurer. And as you know, I still am. And it's like, yeah, dude. So that, that's when my adventurous side, uh, started coming online. So I, again, like what I'm listening to is that more and more of yourself start showing up. And another uh, pattern I see is changing, kind of like radical changes. Um, you you really like to take risk, and you would like yeah. to like really explore what is out there, and very spontaneous in a sense. Let's go and give it a try. Uh, very young in the heart when you when you think like that. Let's go. There is no rules that keeps me grounded. I'm gonna go do what my heart is saying at this point yeah, of time did, and let's uh, see what comes. Uh, hold on one second did you say very yang 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 in heart yin yin very yin the 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 feminine the Taoist principle no i meant like very uh uh you still have the child inside oh you. gotcha yeah 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 100 percent, man 100 percent. the inner child yeah man so which you want to explore, which you want, would like to go to new places, try new things, and it's not scared of dreaming. Even the practicality might be a different thing. Um, what happened after coming back? So where did life take you and what was the direction you were going in? Yeah, so after New Zealand, I was like, okay, I love New Zealand. I might move here. Um... But I, I was a little bit less certain than I was before. Like, before I went to New Zealand, I was like, I'm going to move there. That's, that's it. Um, and then when I was there, I was like, I love this place, but it's so far removed from the world. It's like, it's just so far removed, man. Like, you know, it's far away from the Los Angeles podcasting circuit, from the American podcasting circuit. None of my, my community is here. And so I, I kind of like... I was like, okay, I'm open to doing something different. So then that's why I went to British Columbia. Because I was like, okay, I like the mountains. I like the epic landscapes. But at least if I go to British Columbia, I'm in Canada. I'm in North America. And I'm closer to the, the action, so to speak. Um, but so I came back home. And then I was um, living with uh, together with my mother for a few months. And then at this point... I was start I started up my podcast um in and, and, and I'd figured out I wanted to also do music reactions. So I wanted to do a reaction channel um and then leverage that uh for a podcasting career. And so I started doing um yeah, that and then my mother and I got into a or I wouldn't really say we got into a fight. Um it was actually more of my sister and I. My sister and I were really at, like, at each other's throats. Um, very different political beliefs, very different social beliefs, very different perspectives, spiritual beliefs, all these kind of things. And so it got really difficult. Um, and so I, I left and I moved in with my dad. 
Um, and I started my, really, I pushed my uh, music reaction career um, when I was living with my dad. And um, yeah, what was my, what was my, what was I thinking? I was not, I would like to also like, like you to add how much it grew. I know your channel kind of grew, right? When people listen to like music reaction, they don't understand the potential of it. Um, but then your your channel kind of grew. I don't know if it's fast, but you still have quite many subscribers listening and watching you. Yeah, man. I I, I got seventy five thousand total uh, between all of my channels because um, I had three reaction channels, um, mm -hmm. and so like one had like twenty eight thousand subscribers. One was like all about pop music, and it had like thirty five thousand subscribers, and the other had like rock and metal music, and that was like. 15,000 subscribers. So like all, all in all, I had about 70,000 or something. So mm -hmm. it, it did really well. I was one of the top performing channels um, on the internet. Mm -hmm. I, I would consider myself, I wasn't an elite performing channel, but I was one of the mid range to, to high range. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my, my growth rate was very, very quick. Um, and I actually did a couple of things to sabotage my growth rate um, mm -hmm. by literally closing a channel that was growing rapidly um, to pivot and do something else. So again, it's this like risk taking side that you talked about. Like I, I'm very quick to, as soon as I figure out, like I'm being guided by, I, I, so I, I call it my soul. I'm not religious. Um, I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious, but I, I, I have the belief that I can get in contact with, with my subconscious, my soul, whatever word someone wants to call it inner self, higher self, whatever. And so as soon as I get a feeling that, okay, I'm being called to do something, I immediately pretty much do it. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, so yeah, it was growing really rapidly. Um, and then when, I, when the time was right, I left my dad's place and I was like, hey dad, I'm going to move to Mexico. <laughs> so, so, yeah my, ne my next adventure so i have a i i notice how these go now whenever i tell somebody i'm gonna move somewhere it's really just code for i'm gonna travel there and explore there it is a strong calling because i before that I, I hadn't differentiated between an overwhelming calling to some place and wanting to move there i thought they were the same thing and so i was like okay i'm going to move to mexico so i was going to travel mexico for a month and a half and then move to Ensenada and continue my podcast there. And so sure enough, so I leave, I leave my dad's place. I'm on my, my voyage to Mexico. And then I'm like, and then my soul is just like, dude, you got way more time here than a month and a half. And I was like, Oh shit. And so I sent a post to every, all of my community. And I was like, Hey guys, I'm going to be gone longer than I thought. Mm. And so next thing you know, man, like I'm traveling Mexico, all of the States for like fucking five months. Um, and then I go to Ensenada where I'm going to move and, and set up shop. And, uh, and I, 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 I literally get off the bus in Ensenada, dude. I look around, I go, this is a shithole. And I literally get back on the bus and go up into California. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to continue this trip and just see what happens. Mm. So I go to California. I'm not a huge fan. Then I go to Arizona, fell in love with Arizona. And it was like, I might move to Sedona. Like this place is freaking awesome. Uh, then I went to Texas I, uh, to see my buddy Ian. And, uh, and Texas is pretty cool. Um, I didn't like it nearly as much as Sedona. And then I went to South Carolina and then I got the idea, huh, I might move to North Carolina. And so again, I was like, okay, like, cause my soul was like, go to North Carolina. And so I went to North Carolina, fell in love with it. And to this day, I still want to move to North Carolina. Like that is the only place so far I've ever found in my life where I'm like, I could totally see myself living there. Not right now. Like there, my soul's not leading me there yet, but in the future, for sure, there's a possibility. I don't know. We'll see what happens, but there's a strong chance. And so I literally go to North Carolina for a month and I'm traveling all over. Like I rented a Tesla and I just like drove all over North Carolina, like hours every day. And I was just like, this place, like, I was like, this place is freaking awesome. 
And so then I traveled up into British Columbia um, because I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to move back to Canada in the meantime um, while I figure some things out. And I think I might move to British Columbia. So I went to British Columbia and because my soul was calling me to a place called Duncan. Um, and so I went to Duncan for two weeks and I just, you know, traveled around there and I felt called. So I found this guy that was looking for a roommate and I was like, okay, let's move in together. And so we signed a lease. Um, and then I was like, cool, I, we're, I'm going to move in in November. So it, this was in August. Mm. So I was like, I still have more traveling. So then I flew out to Hawaii for two weeks and I traveled to Hawaii for two weeks. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be in Hawaii and just chill. And then I'm going to move back in with my mother for a few months and uh, for two months and then move out to British Columbia. So went to Hawaii, moved back in with my mom for two months, uh, just relaxed, enjoyed it, kind of treated it like a vacation, and then moved to British Columbia. And then I was there for three months. And then when I'm in British Columbia, I'm like, yeah, why the hell am I here? I was like, I don't like it here. <laughs> I was like, I don't like this. And then, because um, I had signed like a, just a month by month. I hadn't signed a lease. It was just kind of flexible. And I realized I was there for my roommate, uh, James, a uh, cool guy, but I had the universe needed me to learn some lessons. Uh, number one boundaries. Cause this guy was a dominant personality. Like he was like a alpha just would tell me stuff. And then I had to learn how to be like, yeah, no, no, we're not doing this dude. And so like, we would kind of like lock horns sometimes. And I think I just needed to be with somebody that I actually liked that was really dominant to like learn how to like find a way to be like, Hey man, I love you, but we're not doing this. It was like how to find that calm yeah. that, that without being a pushover, because usually I'm so loving and compassionate that I'm like, okay, let's do a win-win. Right. And I learned that sometimes, yes, a lot of times it's about win-win, but actually a majority of the time it's like, Okay, if you if this doesn't resonate with you, do not do it and don't give in. So I learned those boundaries. And then when I was in British Columbia, my friend Ian from Texas is like, hey, bro, do you want to move in with me? And we're going to get on Joe Rogan and Lex Friedman. And so I was like, because he's, he's been on a lot of those big podcasts and he's mm -hmm. friends with a lot of those people in, in Texas. And I was like, and so I felt into it for a week. And then my soul was like, yeah, dude, do that. So I was like, all right, man. Yo, I'm coming to Texas. We're going to get a place together and everything. And then so I was like, I was like hey, mom, you can I stay with you for like two months uh, before I go to Texas? Because we had to wait till March. Mm. Um, and she's like, yeah, for sure, man. Cool. And so I moved in with my mother for two months. And then I I go to apply for my my visa. And I miss, and I, I, cause I had talked with an immigration lawyer and he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Here's the process. You can, you can, uh, file on this date. And I was like, cool. So literally I, I go to file my, my, my visa and the, and the, that immigration lawyer is like, you missed the cutoff by one week. Oh. I was like, are you kidding me? Are you like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And I was like all right, I guess the universe needs me here. So I was like, hey, mom, do you mind if I like live here for nine months uh, until I apply for the next one? She's like, yeah, for sure. Um, so I just kind of like, yeah, we have an arrangement. I do all the landscaping, all the stuff. And yeah, so I'm like, cool. It's a, it's a good living arrangement for now. But yeah, that's where I am now. So so hopefully I'm hopefully I'm going to Texas in March, but we'll see where the universe leads me because every time I think something is for sure going to happen, the universe is like, yeah, you have this lesson. And then it just brings me over there, you know? No, not yet time. <laughs> yeah. Keeps you there. But I would like to, like for the viewers, I would like, to, I don't know how much they know about Joe Rogan or the other podcasts. Those are like extremely big. Yeah. So basically you are saying you would like to take podcast is a full-time uh, profession and um, follow that path, right? Um, yeah. I would like to also ask you, like, what do you see? We are coming to the end of the podcast. So I would like, like a few questions for you. Uh, one is, what do you think is 
going to be playing out in the future? Like a best case scenario in your head, when would you like it to go? In, in my life? Yeah, so okay. If everything goes according to Anton, the, the ego of Anton, um, I will be in Texas in probably uh, April. Mm -hmm. um, me and Ian will live together. Um, and then pretty much we're going to start our own podcast together. So I'm going to continue to do my The Anton Show, mm -hmm. um, which is a spiritually minded podcast all about culture, spirituality, science, uh, psychology, philosophy, current events. Kind of like, you know, the easiest way to explain it is a more spiritually focused Joe Rogan. Kind of like talking about everything, but with more of a spiritual focus. And then Ian and I are going to be starting a podcast. And then we'll just do that until the, the, the moment is right. And we get an offer on to Rogan or Lex Friedman. So again, if everything goes, goes according to my plan, I, I'll just keep doing my thing um and doing whatever the, where the, wherever the universe brings me um but i'd like to do my podcast and do a podcast with ian and then get on rogan and lex friedman luke story um aubrey marcus like a lot of the podcasts in texas and then you know if that doesn't happen like whatever dude like the universe has a plan for me the universe has a plan for all of us i think like i believe in soul contracts i believe that when we come in this lifetime we reincarnate with a purpose um, and we're, I think we're living in a simulation where we're literally playing this video game of our life and seeing, do we, do we get the gold medal? So if the gold medal is, all right, I'm going to reincarnate as Anton Zakor. I'm going to have this life and then I'm going to, uh, do these 10 things. If I do all the 10 things that I set out to do, then I, I get like, it's like a video game. It's like, I get the top prize. I'm like, gold medal, you did everything you wanted to do. Um, and also, obviously, it might not work like that. Like, there might not be any... It might just be like, all right, this... Actually, I do think it kind of is like a gold medal because I think the whole reason you give yourself soul contracts because apparently from my psychic friends, this is a real legit thing. I want to develop my abilities where I can actually tap into my own Akashic records and my soul contracts. Mm. But until then, I'll just listen to my friends who have done this before <laughs> but apparently you literally come in with these soul contracts and so yeah ultimately i just want to do whatever i'm meant to do and if that's if i'm meant to be on rogan i'll be on rogan if i'm meant to be on lex friedman I, i'll be on lex friedman if i'm not meant to be cool i'll let go of that that's just my ego my ego has its own things but what my relationship with my ego is it's totally cool if my ego wants things like that's rad, man. Like I want things, but when my, when my intuition like corroborates that and goes, yeah, dude, that ego thing that you want, that actually is rad. Like, I want you to do that too. Like says your soul, that is the best case scenario when your ego and your soul are aligned. I think that's just fun. That's just when life is the most fun because you're engaging with life on life's terms but you're playing this mystery game of like, I wonder if I could figure out where this is going. Like that, that, that's the, the whole fun of it for me. And so, yeah. So you can see where, it, where I end up, man. And no matter what, I'm happy. I'm loving my life. My life is just a big, huge adventure. And I'm just partying, man. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, I think like this to add before the close of the podcast, I feel like the way I think about life is that, you know, it's a constant learning process. You know, the more you learn, the more things you understand. It, it might not fundamentally change life, but the idea is to keep learning about all kinds of things, about, for example, freedom, about society, about yourself, about others. So as long as you go with the flow of what life is trying to teach you, you are already doing extremely well by just by learning in front of you. Other things about like fame and fortune and great successful life, according to Forbes, <laughs> it, it comes from, like you were saying, it's a, it's a way of creating value within you. Um, and that has its own way of happening. If it comes to a place where you learn enough, uh, the things that you need to be learned, 
um, then it happens as well. But I feel like it doesn't happen for the purpose of creating value and like, you know, like not just for personal pressure, that happens because your soul need to learn certain things. And if that aligns, yes, that happens as well. Uh, but not for the same reasons. Um, I think like we have come to um, end of the podcast. I wanted to really talk to you about a lot of spiritual concepts, but since the hour has ended, we cannot go there now. But maybe in the future, because I know you talk like really well about a lot of very fun spiritual topics. Uh, hopefully we could go into that at some point of time. Yeah, um, dude, yeah, that, that, that'd be a lot of fun, man. It's because like, you know, just for, for anyone listening, like I'm a practitioner of uh, human design, gene keys. I do life coaching myself. Um, I'm big into IFS, which is internal family systems. Um, and yeah, like I studied astrology for like two years, several years ago. Like I've always been in these spiritual arts. And a lot of the time I talk about these things in a very uh, loose, woo-woo, fun. I throw around words like reincarnation and psychics. But it's like, yeah, it's, I, I do my best unless someone asks for it. I do my best not to get like bogged down in all the details because I'm like, at the end of the day, this stuff is just fun. You know, spirituality is freaking awesome. It's like, you know, exactly. It's like understanding the universe, you and how all this came to existence in different narratives. I don't think there's anything more fun. <laughs> yeah it's like it could be like people could see like oh you're speculating or you're coming with narratives it's how it is because the absolute yeah. truth is not just one it's uh the how you look at um but i would add also like and on show and on and on channels below in the description so whoever would like to check them out and support and on please go and do that uh, and thank you and on for spending the time and effort uh, to be in the show. And I, I'm cutting it now, but I would like to talk to you for five minutes before we part ways. Absolutely, man. It's a pleasure. And thank you for having me on, dude.